Hello, everyone. The Richard von Hess Foundation was established in Lancaster in 1989 to promote art education and art history. Franklin Marshall is fortunate to have received a three-year collaborative residency in art history focused in providing deep and enduring conversations between scholars, artists, and practitioners on the power of art to address fundamental human questions of our day. Anthropologists Jason DeLeon, photographer Michael Wells, and artist Lucy Cahill are the first residents of this exciting new program. They are here for a whole week, along with five of their students, conversing with our students, faculty, and the Lancaster community. Jason DeLeon's book, The Land of Open Graves, has been the subject of a semester-long reading group and has been assigned to no less than six, six classes, ranging from earth and environment and art history to government and international studies. Doing some quick calculations, 200 students are currently reading and engaging with today's Common Hour speaker. So Jason, using your pottery shard counting clicker, every 10th person you cross on your walk through campus this week has actually already read your words. Beyond their physical presence, De Leon, Wells, and Cahill have left our campus with a treasure, a multimedia exhibition, Hostile Terrain, which will remain in view at the Phillips Museum for the duration of the semester. I invite you all to the opening reception soon after Common Hour. We can also continue talking to Jason, but also meet Michael and Lucy. Time to introduce our speaker. Jason DeLeon is the vocalist and guitarist for the late 90s California hardcore punk reggae band Youth in Asia and the early 2000s Americana band Wilcox Hotel based out of Penn State. Wait, wait, I have the wrong introduction. Jason DeLeon is indeed a rock star, literally, but also figuratively. He's as close as an archaeology professor can get to academic stardom. The MacArthur Foundation awarded him a Genius Award in 2017 for his pioneering forensic and ethnographic work in the Undocumented Migration Project that turns the rigor of archaeological documentation to the passage of undocumented migrants across the Mexico-US border. In his book, he writes, quote, if you live in the United States, you already know about many of these people you meet in these pages. They pick your fruit, detail your cars, and process your meat, end of quote. In spite of the nonstop media coverage of caravans, borders, walls, and government shutdowns, what we have not dared to address as a nation is the lives of migrants, particularly when they, they perform a lethal drama between their bodies and the otherwise beautiful landscape of the Sonora Desert. As director of the Undocumented Migration Project, Jason DeLeon has been collecting these stories during the last 10 years through the proxy of objects, images, and testimonies. His project rejects the simplistic binary between human and non-human agents, showing how we have passed moral responsibility to the landscape and made it into our sub-agent of enforcement, cruelty, and sometimes death. Jason DeLeon received his PhD from Penn State in 2008 with a thes thesis on Mesoamerican stone tools. Since 2010, he has been professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan, and this fall he will be star starting a new position as professor of anthropology and Chicano studies at UCLA, his undergraduate alma mater. On behalf of the Von Hess Foundation, the departments of art and art history, earth and environment, anthropology, Latin American studies, international studies, Bonchek College House, and the Phillips Museum, I welcome you to Common Hour. Your visit inaugurates a new curriculum in our forced migration and also the new Von Hess Foundation Collaborative Residency. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Costis, for that very kind um, introduction. And I, I just want to thank um, the Phelps Museum and Amy Morfield and and everybody here at FNM who has been so um, welcoming and supportive of our project and, and hosting us. Um, we brought five University of Michigan students with us here who have been um, hard at work on our exhibition. We might actually leave one here. Um, she, she seems to already be working on the transfer process, so <laughs> you, you guys have been very, very kind uh, to us. Um, we're talking about border walls, um, and I did not think in 2019 I would be talking about border walls, but here we find ourselves. And um, in the midst of this government shutdown, we need to really, I think, understand why we don't need a border wall, but also, more importantly, what are the realities of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so this, for me, is a smokescreen. This, for me, is, um, is not what we should be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the humanitarian crisis that is currently underway. 
And to do that today, uh, I'm unfortunately going to take us to some difficult places. Uh, the realities that migrants experience are brutal, and uh, I'm not here to, to sugarcoat those things. So just to give you a little bit of a warning that we're going we're gonna to navigate some, some difficult uh, ter uh, territory. And I'll just start and I'll tell a, a, qu a quick little story here. Day one. Flies. I mostly remember the goddamn flies. And it's funny how, how memory works. I made a thousand mental notes of the scene, and I wrote many of them down soon after the event. But only a couple of years later, they now seem to be forgotten, buried, reduced to background noise. After spending just a few weeks at the U.S.-Mexico border, hanging out with the desperate people looking to breach America's immigration defenses, I quickly learned that death, violence, and suffering are par for the course. It all starts to blur together. Disturbing images start to lose their edge. As an observer, as an anthropologist, you grow accustomed to seeing strangers cry at the drop of a hat. Those tears, though, they no longer have the impact that they once did. These tragic stories repeatedly told over and over again under the strain of a cracking voice, these stories are transformed into well-worn hymns that lose their pervenience and for me become difficult to organize, to seriate, to think about. I fought sensory overload and I continue to this day to fight sensory overload because I don't want to lose sight of the big picture or the brutal details. I have tried to write all this stuff down so that I could later connect these realities that I have observed as a researcher to the larger structural forces that make this nightmare, this American immigration nightmare. And so I kept telling myself, be an anthropologist, write these things down, remember. But it's hard. And, and I remember the first time that I encountered death in this context, it was incredibly difficult and challenging. And I told myself, how am I going to write these things down? What am I going to do with this stuff? This is easier said than done. But it doesn't matter, because on this particular day that I'm talking about, July of 2009, none of this stuff could be comprehended, much less theorized. All I could do was stare at the flies and wonder how the hell they'd gotten there so quickly. This happened the first day of ethnographic research that I was conducting in the border town of Nogales, Mexico. I'd spent the sweltering morning in the shade talking to recently deported migrants. A few of them had been deported from elsewhere by the Department of Homeland Security in hopes that being placed in close proximity to the Sonora Desert of Arizona, where hundreds of people die every year migrating, that this would be enough to deter them from crossing. I didn't know this man's name, but I had seen him earlier in the day. Among the, the tired masses of deportees, this dude did not stand out. Recently repatriated people are quite easy to spot in border towns. This is because of the uniformity of their appearance. Dark t-shirts with powdery salt rings under the armpits, uh, sneakers that look like they've gone through a meat grinder, dusty black backpacks stuffed with a few extra socks, some cans of food, and whatever meager personal possessions these folks have been able to hang on to. These brown bodies, they broadcast exhaustion and vulnerability like a scarlet letter. These folks, their faces show a mix of sorrow, weariness, fear, and optimism. Maybe they walked for three days lost before uh, quenched a, a paralyzing thirst at a cattle trough where the water was mostly bugs and green algae. Maybe they'd been robbed at gunpoint by, uh, by bandits. Maybe they'd been sexually assaulted by bandits or by the border patrol before being deported. Still, they'll tell you the next time is going to be different. You got to have hope. You got to be optimistic. There's a husband waiting for you in Carborough, North Carolina. There's a guaranteed job painting houses in Phoenix, Arizona. There's a little girl back in a tiny village in Guerrero, uh, Mexico, called El Manchon, who's got a hungry belly, and so you will go. Si Dios quiere, voy a pasar. God willing, I will get across, and the next time is going to be different. I don't remember what this person looked like when he was alive. I didn't really notice him at all that morning uh, as I was making my way towards a convenience store uh, to conduct some interviews. Like many people who get caught in the cycle of repeated crossing attempts, they keep trying. It doesn't matter what kind of walls or barriers you put up, people will keep trying. This individual, after many attempts, had decided uh, uh, to spend the morning drinking a kawama, a quart-sized bottle of beer, while he planned to do what, what his, his, next, his next crossing. I had passed him a few hours prior um, that morning, 
and I took more notice of that early happy hour he was having than his actual facial features. All I can remember is that he was tall, skinny, and had a shaved head. The next time I saw him, though, was when I spotted a crowd gathering near an abandoned field. I walked up to investigate, and I found myself standing behind a chain-link fence with a group of migrants and a short, bald man that I would soon come to know as Chucho. For ten minutes, me, Chucho, and this group of migrants stared in silent awe at the limp body flopped on the dirt. This person had been dead for less than an hour, and yet the flies were already there in full force. They were landing on his milky eyeballs and crawling in and out of his open mouth. His head was turned and facing this crowd of migrants. He seemed to be staring right through everyone. We watched flies lay eggs on this man's face for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, some good Samaritan showed up with a Dallas Cowboys bed sheet and covered him up. A paramedic and a few of the neighbors milled around the corpse chatting, but nobody seemed to be phased. Death lay there like a casual summer breeze. I thought to myself, maybe this guy was headed to Dallas so he could wash dishes at an Applebee's. Or maybe he hated the Pinchy's Cowboys after spending way too many years in Philadelphia doing landscaping jobs and rooting for the Eagles. Nobody seemed to know him, though. They just knew that he needed to be covered up to keep the flies away. I turned to Chucho for some insight into the spectacle, and he shrugged and he said, this happens all the time, my friend. Some people just get tired of trying to cross the border after many failed attempts. Some turn to drugs and alcohol to kill time, to kill pain. Who knows what killed him, he said. Reading the worry on my face, Chucho continues, you watch. No one will remember this tomorrow. It's like it didn't even happen. And he was right. The next day, I would ask migrants about the dead body in the field 300 feet from the liquor store, and nobody would know what I was talking about. It was almost as if it didn't happen. So today, I'm going to talk about, about those migrant deaths. And, um, and many of the stories that I'm going to draw from come from the book that one, that one in 10 of you are reading at the moment. Um, um, a book called The Land of Open Graves that features um, text written by me and, and uh, photographs by my longtime collaborator, Michael Wells. Um, to give us a little bit of architecture here for the talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of U.S. border policies as it, as, as it currently stands. I'm going to talk about um, this, this concept of taphonomy, um, so what happens to the dead uh, and its relationship to political violence. And then I'm going to tell three more stories about people who have been erased people who've been returned, and people who have disappeared uh, into the ether. And if you take anything away from this talk today, it's these things. We don't need a border wall. We have a giant wall. It's called the Sonora Desert of Arizona, and it literally kills people. More importantly, these deaths that migrants are experiencing, it's not, this is not an unintended consequence. This is not collateral damage. This is direct, uh, the direct result of a federal formal policy. And then finally, I want to drive home the fact that the postmortem treatment of these corpses of people who have died in the Sonora Desert is brutal and violent and political and has far-reaching repercussions. The work that I'm going to talk about today comes from the Undocumented Migration Project, an interdisciplinary research endeavor that I've, conducted, that I've directed since 2009. And essentially, it's, a, it's an attempt to steal freely from every single discipline we can imagine in hopes of documenting and, and developing a more nuanced understanding of border crossings. So this involves ethnography, archaeology, forensic science, visual anthropology, linguistics, um, every th single thing that we can imagine we have tried to throw at this issue to help tell these stories. Um, and before I can get into the, the details about this current situation, I just want you to know what it used to look like. Prior to 1993, border crossings tended to be like this, happening in broad daylight in urban, ports, uh, urban zones where people would, would hop the fence in downtown San Diego, in downtown El Paso, cross the border, run into town, hide amongst the, the, um, the population there, go to work, do whatever they're going to do, and then return to Mexico the, uh, uh, whenever they wanted to. Uh, this, at one point, became very um, politically messy and difficult to explain for politicians who were being uh, told that, look, our border is out of control. And fix this problem. We don't, this, is, this is an unsightly issue for some. And so what ended up happening is we developed this, this policy called prevention through deterrence. 
And the idea was that to get rid of this, we're going to put more agents on the ground at these ports of entry. We're going to put more cars on the, on the ground, more cameras, more motion sensors, so it'll become virtually impossible to cross in an urban zone. And so instead of crossing there, you walk five or six miles east or west where, where the population drops off, the town disappears, and there's nobody around. You can hop the fence there and then walk back into town. And, and this policy became known as prevention through deterrence. The idea had been recognized that, hey, if we stop them at the port of entry and make them go left or right and, and, and walk for several miles to get out into the desert or some wilderness, that they will be, um, they'll be easier to catch. If you find a, if you find a, a, a person stumbling around in the Sonora Desert, there's a high likelihood that they are a migrant. And the policy makers who were developing this, this program recognized, too, that the border itself is, is a whole bunch of extreme environments, mountainous terrain, um, uh, depopulated deserts, rushing water, all of these places that are, are quite difficult for the human to, to cross on foot. And it was recognized that if they could shift people over to these places, um, this would disrupt migration and would help facilitate better um, immigration uh, um, border enforcement. And more importantly, it was recognized that if you force these people out into these difficult areas, these remote, un, quote, uninhabited expanses of land and sea, people will find themselves in mortal danger. Right? They, will, they will risk their lives. They will potentially die in these places. And the idea had been, if we force them over this, quote, more hostile terrain, that they will stop coming. They'll be easier to catch because they'll either be dead or they'll be exhausted. But in fact, um, they have just been dead, and, and they've been killed, and they've been exhausted, but people have continued to come. So this hasn't slowed down migration. It's just made it more difficult. And we've ended up leaving the back door of many places completely wide open. Um, I know, you know, Arizona, a state that I have a, a deep love for, um, after starting this, this project, I grew up in LA where, for me, Arizona represented all kinds of really negative things. And obviously, the state has a complicated relationship to immigration. Um, and people oftentimes will, will dismiss the, um, the anti-immigrant stuff as the direct result of just racism. And obviously, racism is there and xenophobia is there. But you keep, have to keep in mind, too, that the federal government has used Arizona as a labyrinth to funnel migrants towards for the last 20 years. Over five million people have been apprehended in southern Arizona's desert um, while, while trying to cross, which has put an enormous amount of strain on those communities along the border. Um, but this is all, um, all by design. And so we've closed off urban areas and we've left places like the, the South Texas backwood and, and southern Arizona wide open. And if you go to the border, it looks like this. This is outside of the town of Sassabee. You walk three miles from that little town e east or west, the, the fence disappears and you basically have this. This is because you, you can't build a fence, you can't build a wall in, in many of these difficult areas. It's not worth it. It'll be destroyed in a matter of years um, because of the, um, the, the conditions. It's an architectural impossibility and a prohibitively expensive um, endeavor. And we know that it doesn't work. You can hop over this, you can go underneath it, you can do all kinds of things to get, to get around this barrier. This is what the actual wall looks like. Hundreds of square miles of depopulated um, uh, terrain. And if we look at prevention through deterrence and its attempts to use this environment over the years, there's a direct correlation between this policy and migrant death. It starts in 1993. Um, officially, it, it is, is put forth in 1994. NAFTA happens in 1994. We crash the Mexican economy with, um, um, with this trade agreement, forcing people to leave their homes. And now, um, now they're forced to walk across the Sonora Desert to find, to find work. Since that time, the bodies of 3,199 um, people have been recovered in southern Arizona. Um, and I'm going to argue today that that's a low number. And it's one thing to look at these numbers like this. Um, you can plot them on a Google document, and it looks like this. Um, or you can, um, you, can, you can look up close at the, at the names and the causes of death and the locations of these places. Um, this week in our exhibition, Hostile Terrain, we've installed uh, a giant map of southern Arizona with 3,000 body bag tags for, uh, for, for those who have died while crossing. And um, you, can, you can go and look at that and engage with, 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 this, with this piece um, to get a sense of the, the weight of this humanitarian crisis. So it looks like this. This is what prevention through deterrence looks like. And when we talk about the death toll, we knew early on that this was going to happen. 
federal um, evaluators recognized that one way to evaluate this policy was to look at the death count. If the death count goes up, this policy is potentially um, working. And also recognize that if we force people into these areas, that the death rate is likely to increase. We knew this was going to happen, and then, of course, it happened. And I would argue that this idea that, uh, that if you're, we can funnel people to a place where we put them in, in grave danger and mortal risk, um, that's just how we view immigrants in this country. That's how we, th we think about migrants, as totally expendable people. And we have this federal policy in place that literally kills them, and, um, and, and nobody seems to care. So I want to show you a little bit what it looks like, and then I want to talk about those who have not made it. This is Memo and Lucho, two, two men that I got to know quite well in, in 2009 and who I, um, whose stories I've, I've been documenting over the years, who um, during their final crossing uh, trip took a series of photographs with disposable cameras to document their, um, uh, their experiences. They would tell you if you were going to cross into Arizona, you would first start in a place called Altar. Altar is a, is a border town that functions largely around human smuggling. You would go to Altar where the local baseball team are called the Coyotes. So in Spanish, Coyote is a euphemism for human smuggler. Um, everybody knows that in Altar, that's what you're, what you're there to do, is to be smuggled, um, to the point that the local baseball team even makes a reference to it. Um, you, would, you would start in Altar, you would, um, you would hook up with your, with your smuggler, and then they would drive you up to the border wall, up to the desert, and then you would enter on foot. Before you do that, you need to get some supplies, camouflage clothes, camouflage um, uh, backpack, hiking boots, first aid equipment, high salt content foods, uh, two gallons of water because that's all that you can carry. You need to, you need to get the, the, the tools to survive this desert because you're going to have to walk a lot, upwards of 70 miles through a landscape that looks like this where temperatures can, can be over 100 degrees daily in the summer where you can freeze to death in the, in the winter. Tucson just had snow up, up in these mountains a few weeks ago. So you can freeze to death in the winter. You can, you can die of hyperthermia in the summer. Uh, there's many things that can get you. And you're not going to have an easy walk. You're not wearing um, overpriced REI uh, boots and carrying a compass. You're going to be in cheap sneakers or, or clunky construction boots with a few, uh, a, a few meager possessions in your backpack and, and not much else. And you're going to get up into the mountains because it's hard to catch people up in the mountains. You're going to do a lot of it at, at night, sleeping out in the woods, hiking in the dark so that you can stay hidden. You don't have a flashlight, you don't have a compass, you don't have a map. You're using the stars to navigate and other, and other uh, landmarks. You're going to deal with an incredibly inhospitable environment with more rattlesnake species of rattlesnakes than any place else in the Western Hemisphere, where every single creature has evolved to bite, scratch, stick you, um, inject poison in you. It's a very, very difficult, um, uh, a difficult environment with lots of, um, of hazards for, for human uh, passerbys. And you might end up in things like, unexpected things like, trying to cross a, a wash during a flash flood. This is Memo and Lucho in the midst of the, this crossing where they um, um, suddenly find themselves trying to get across a, a rushing body of water. And I always joke that, how do you know when you've developed rapport with people that you work with? And I say, well, it's when they're in the midst of something totally traumatic and difficult, and then they stop and go, you know, you know who would love a picture of this? Jason. You know, and they stop and pose and take a picture. So I'm always deeply grateful to these, to these men for, 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 for trusting me and for thinking about me during a moment when they, they really didn't have to do anything of, of, the, of the sort. So I'm, I'm always grateful to be able to, to share their stories. And Memo and Lucha will tell you that it's, it's physically exhausting. It's a devastating process. Um, you will walk for many, many days. And uh, if, you, um, don't, if, you, if you have a pre-existing medical condition that you don't know about, this is likely a time where you're going to figure that out because you will push your body to the extreme. Um, what we've tried to do over the years is to both document these stories through ethnography and through interviews and through photography, but also through the lens of archaeology. So here's, a, here's a, a shot of Lucho on the ground. He's got his backpack and his um, a few um, uh, medical things, foot powder and other stuff that he's taken out. Oftentimes, this stuff gets left behind, and we have been following in the footsteps of migrants and documenting these things as archaeological assemblages, so collecting the water bottles and the clothing and the backpacks, uh, some of which you can see here in our um, current exhibition. And these objects tell a lot of stories, tell us a lot about these experiences 
Uh, and I think they're even more powerful when you connect these objects to the actual voices of migrants themselves, which is what we've tried to do um, in, in much of our work. And this stuff can be really overwhelming. I mean, it's overwhelming emotionally, it's overwhelming physically. Um, some of these big accumula uh, uh, accumulations of materials where people are about to get picked up by their smugglers and are getting ready to hop into a vehicle and they're told, drop everything, change your clothes, get in the car, um, leave everything behind. M much gets left behind. And over the years, we have experimented with different ways of telling these stories through both writing um, as well as through ex exhibition work. And we hope that the, that the show that's up today will, will get you a little bit closer to understanding these experiences. But I want to talk about those people who didn't make it, the people who, who, have, who were left behind and who may still be out there. Let me tell you another story. The Norwegian explorer Carl Lumholtz, he once wrote that the, the heat in Sonora is like, quote, walking between great fires. But I think that's putting it nicely. Because right now, in this moment, out in the desert, it feels like we are walking directly through flames. It's easily over 100 degrees, and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm climbing to the Tumacacari Mountains with my longtime friend Bob Key, a member of the Southern Arizona humanitarian group, the Tucson Samaritans. Bob has been haunting these trails for years, leaving food and water for unseen migrants, and occasionally giving first aid to abandoned souls that he comes across. It's a rough path full of sharp angled rocks and angry mesquites, whose branches all seem to be aiming for your eyes as you're trying to walk past them. We're almost there, I promise, Bob says. I force a smile because that dude's always lying to me to make me feel better. Almost there is one of Bob's euphemisms for four more miles to go, and probably uphill. Um, but on this particular day, his tone is, not, uh, is, not, is, is, is different. He's not his normal jovial self. He hasn't been joking around, which usually is his offering to carry me on his back. Uh, and Bob is uh, 35 years older than I am, and I just it's, it's, he's a superhuman creature. Uh, but on this particular day, he's not, he's not giving me a hard time. Um, it's clear he's on a mission. We round a bend and we stop, and he calmly says to me in, 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 in a way that only really Bob can say it, this is the spot where I found the person. The sheriff came out and took away what we could find but it was getting dark, and we didn't have a lot of time to go over the area. It was mostly arm and leg bones, he says, and some pieces of clothing. I want to see if we can find the head, he says. That would make it easier to identify the body. I'm sure that there are still bones out here. He's right. There are bones that the police overlooked, but we have to cover a, lo a lot of ground before we can find them, and there are pieces everywhere. We walk down slope, and I see a human arm wedged between two rocks. Outside of the sinew that is holding the joint together, it's been picked clean of skin and muscle by some unknown creature. Further up the trail, I notice several white flecks that stand out against the red mountain soil. It looks like someone dropped a box of chalkboard, uh, blackboard chalk on the ground. I get up close and I look and I realize that they're splinters of human bone, mostly sun-bleached rib fragments that have been cracked and gnawed by some long-gone animal. Just off the trail, I spot a complete tooth lying on top of a rock. And this, dental, and this dental find, it gives us hope that maybe the skull is nearby. We desperately start looking for this person's head. We're flipping over rocks, sticking my hands in subterranean nests. Um, our arms are bleeding from digging through all the bushes. But after 45 minutes, we give up. There's no skull. We do, however, come across a pair of worn out hiking boots in, in close proximity to those bones. Where the hell is the skull? I start imagining what has happened to it. I see this montage of laughing vultures, and they are ripping the person's eyeballs out of the sockets. I hallucinate two coyotes batting the head around like a ball so that they can better access the brain matter through the hole in the back of the skull, the form and magnum. This is a moment when you despise the capacity of the human imagination. And people who have lost loved ones out in the desert they will tell you that it is the not knowing what has happened to those people, coupled with these, these moments of, of grotesque possibility that you can imagine. It's those things that drive you insane. We start to walk away, and I crouch down to pick up a, a small piece of bone off the ground that's, that's the size of my fingernail, and it immediately turns to dust. 
I try to hand it to Bob and put it into a plastic bag so we can take it back with us. And particles blow off of my, off of my hand from the wind. I scrape what I can of this person off of my fingernail and put it into a bag. But it's a futile gesture. There's nothing you can do with bone dust. Forensic scientists don't, don't want that stuff. It's, it's not helpful. This person will likely become a line in the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner's database of migrant fatalities. And they're going to be basically reduced to name, unknown, age, unknown, country of origin, unknown, cause of death, undetermined, skeletal remains. This person's been swallowed up by the desert and there was nobody to witness it. But maybe the cause of death should just read prevention through deterrence. And so for me, I've been trying to understand what those deaths mean and what they look like. And to do that, I have tried to explore um, different forensic approaches to better document this thing that is happening that is invisible. And I'm going to give you one, uh, one uh, $20 word today, and that's taphonomy. Um, taphonomy is a simple, a simple theoretical concept. It just refers to the cultural and natural things that happen to dead organisms. So you have a dinosaur, it dies, it gets covered in water, creatures eat, the, eat, eat its flesh, it gets buried under soil, it fossilizes, and then it gets dug up later on by paleontologists. Every single one of those things that impacts that body, whether it's the, uh, the, the microbes eating it, the water impacting it, or the, the people digging it up, those are what we call taphonomic processes. And you could think about it in, in human terms, how we treat the dead. Do we bury them? Do we cremate them? Do we exhume them? Do we analyze them? All of those things are taphonomic processes. My, my very brilliant friend Shannon Dottie pointed out that, hey, taphonomy is not just for dinosaurs. Taphonomy is also not just strictly about, um, about water and microbes and, um, and insects. Taphonomy is a cultural process. It's a social process. And people have pointed out that, hey, if you look at how we treat the dead in all kinds of different contexts, whether that's in the context of mass graves or um, in, a, in a family burial, how we treat those dead tells us a whole hell of a lot about the dead and how we view the dead and the beliefs of the living about that dead person. And we don't need to look far to see moments in things like American history where we have taphonomically mistreated the dead, especially the dead of our enemies. Now, this is a, a very famous photo from Time Life magazine of a young girl writing a letter to her boyfriend uh, who had been stationed overseas in Japan to thank him for the, quote, Jap skull that he, uh, that he sent her in the mail as a souvenir from, from the war. That is taphonomy, that is a violent form of taphonomy, and it's one that tells us quite a bit about how uh, the American public in the 1940s viewed uh, Japanese people. Um, and I want to argue today that taphonomy can be violent and can also involve both human actors as well as the non-human, so water, wind, insect, animals. All of those things um, can be part of, of, of violent processes. And, and I think that what happens to people's bodies in the Arizona desert is, in fact, violent. Um, if we look at the overall numbers, I mean, we're pushing over 6,000 for numbers of dead, and, and I think that's, that's only starting to become more um, uh, uh, increase in numbers as we're starting to look closely at what's happening in, in Texas and the nightmare of mass, mass graves of unidentified migrant bodies that have been buried over the years with little regard. When we started this project, though, I wanted to know about what happened to the dead, and nobody could give me a good answer. There had been lots of speculation, like we don't, maybe people get mummified, maybe, the, maybe animals eat them, maybe the bodies that we find, that's all that's out there. Maybe they preserve really well, or maybe people disappear. Um, there were too many maybes for us, and so I wanted to find ways to document this thing that, that was super invisible. I wanted to understand death through, um, through a rigorous uh, scientific, social scientific approaches. And so I'm going to show a little bit of experimental work here that involves the use of the bodies of, uh, of animals, in this case pigs, that have been used as proxies for human bodies um, per um, the, uh, the standard technique that's been used in forensic science for over 30 years. But these are, these are some, some difficult photos of, of animals, and I would be happy to talk about the ethics of this work either in the Q&A here or after in the exhibition. 
because I, I know it's a, it's a difficult thing and um, potentially a, a seemingly contradictory thing for me to come up here and say, I'm concerned about, about violence and about ending violence, and here I am showing images of animals that have had violence committed against them. None of this is done, is done lightly, and I'm always happy to in, engage in a conversation about this work. So what we started doing to understand this was to move beyond the anecdotal, and we began to conduct forensic experiments using, using pigs. These were animals that were, um, that were killed on site by a, a, a professional animal handler, then they were dressed in the clothes that we would expect migrants to be wearing, so dark, um, dark t-shirts, blue jeans. They were given personal effects, and they were put into different environmental contexts some of them in shade, some of them in direct sunlight. Migrants had told stories about covering bodies up with rocks. Um, so we, we did a series of those things. And then we tried to monitor them for, for multiple weeks using uh, trail cameras. And I'm gonna show you a video from one of the trail cameras from, from 2013. This, this animal has been dead for about 48 hours. Um, and at the time, no one had ever written about um, uh, decomposition of human bodies in the Arizona desert that had mentioned the role of scavenging animals like vultures. They're completely missing from the, um, from the literature. And one of the things we found early on was that people who die in the desert are quickly um, consumed by, by birds. And as you can see here on the left, those are, the, those are, those are two feet, one shoe has popped off. So we have to imagine that these, that these animals that are doing um, this, this, this work for, for us humans to understand this thing, uh, standing in for, um, for, for human bodies, we, we have to understand that this happens to people all the time. Um, people who die in the desert are, are, are destroyed by, um, by the animals and the environmental conditions there. And uh, more recently, we've been trying to understand it um, in, um, in different seasonal contexts as well as in um, um, other, um, you know, direct sunlight um, and, um, and semi-shade and, and different contexts. This is from 2018. This animal's been um, dead for about uh, three hours here. Uh, this is what was left uh, after, um, after about six days. So the shoes and the skull and everything else had been, had been carried off by scavengers. And so these things that we've shown through, these, through this research is that Scavenging happens so quickly, and, b and bodies are destroyed, personal effects are completely separated from the, from the human remains that would allow us to better identify these bodies, um, and that we were having all kinds of um, unexpected uh, results. One thing that people had mentioned was, hey, the best way to protect a body is to cover it with rocks, uh, which may, would seem to make sense. We did that, um, forgetting that rocks conduct heat. So the bodies that we covered with rocks heated up much quicker and were consumed at a much higher rate than those that had been left un, um, um, untouched. So the complete opposite of what people, uh, myself included, had expected to happen. But all that being said, I want to talk m at the end today of this talk really about the politics of decomposition, what these types of deaths then mean um, in the context of, of, of humans. And so I'm going to tell a story again. The eight of us stand around her in silent awe. And it's obvious that not everybody in this group has seen a corpse before because someone whispers to me, is she really dead? She's lying face down in the dirt and it appears that she perished while attempting to get up a hill. To get here, she easily walked over 40 miles uh, through the Tumacacri Mountains. Rigor mortis has set in and her fingers have started to curl. Her ankles are swollen to the point that it looks like her sneakers are gonna pop off at any moment. The back of her pants are stained with excrement and bubbling with copper-colored fluids uh, that have been expelled from her body upon death. But these descriptions, they don't do justice to what bodies left in the desert actually look like, smell like, or sound like. Nothing does. Against the quiet backdrop of this desert, you can hear the buzzing of flies busily laying eggs on her and in her. There's also a steady hissing of intestinal gases escaping from her bloated and distended stomach. It sounds like a slow leaking tire. After many days in the sweltering summer heat, her body has begun to change. Her skin has started to blacken and mummify, 
and the bloating is starting to obscure some, some of her uh, physical features. But while parts of her are starting to transform into unfamiliar shapes and colors, her striking jet black hair and the ponytail holder around her wrist, these things hint at the person that she once was. I, a I ask a student to go get a blanket so we can cover her up. It makes those of us that are still alive feel better. High above us, turkey vultures circle her corpse. I count at least four of them, and I marvel at how quickly they've arrived on the scene. But I try to ignore them. I try to put on my social science hat, write it down, document it. I get close, and I scribble down some awkward notes. No backpack or obvious personal possessions. A bottle of electrolyte fluids tucked under her shoulder and face. Later, I go and sit with a group of students under a tree a short distance away. And the silence among us is tense and only occasionally broken when a breeze comes through and rustles the branches of nearby trees. Vultures continue to circle overhead. They are simultaneously implicated in and oblivious to the complex human drama playing out below them. All these stupid birds know is that we've disrupted their lunch. I want to say something to our group that will give us comfort or make this death seem peaceful or dignified, but it's the dumbest thought I've ever had. There's nothing you can say in this moment that does not sound contrived. And months later, someone will corner me after a talk and they'll complain that the photo I showed of her hand is robbing this person of dignity. And I will point out that, hey, these types of deaths that migrants experience in the desert, they're not expected to be dignified. That's the point. This is what prevention through deterrence looks like. And these photographs should make us all feel uncomfortable because the reality is right now that bodies are laying rotting on the desert floor and there aren't enough witnesses. These photos provide evidence that we don't have to go to exotic places to see full frontal views of the dead and dying. They live in our backyard. Cuenca, Ecuador. This is the tag that I wrote for Maricela. This is the tag that you can go see that's on the wall here at the Phillips Museum. Her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuyas. She was 30 years old when she left uh, a husband and three children behind in Cuenca, Ecuador in June of 2012 to try to make it to the United States. She likely died from a combination of hyperthermia and a pre-existing uh, kidney condition. One of the last things her, she said to her family in Ecuador was, my kids are dying of hunger here. My kids are suffering. Whatever my destiny is, I must go. After finding her body, I made contact with Maricela's family. Um, both in New York and in Ecuador. And her sister-in-law, Christina, said to me, they told us don't open the coffin when they sent Maricela back. My plan for, had been for her to get to Ecuador. We were going to change her clothes, dress her up for the funeral. But when she got here and we opened that box, and we shouldn't have opened that box, there was no face. Uh, she had been unembalmed in cold storage for three weeks after being in the desert for almost a week. She had no hands. They had to saw her hands off to rehydrate them in saline to get fingerprints. They, they, sh they were told not to open the box, but of course they had to open the box. She said it didn't look like her, and there were doubts that maybe that's not her body. Maybe she's still out there in the desert, and we just haven't found her. How do they identify her, she says. We want to know what, what happened to her, because when she got here, she was destroyed. So Mike and I went to Ecuador, and we bought pictures of the body for the family to see. They needed some, some closure. But there's still no closure. Christina says to me, if this is her buried here, really buried here, then thank God. But I'm telling you, I don't think it was her. It was difficult to see, to see a body and try to, and try to think that, that that was Maricela, that that was a person that I loved and cared about. It was very difficult to see her in that, in that form. And so finally, I just want to end talking about those who will never be returned, who will never be buried. Clinical psychologist Pauline Boss, she has a phrase called ambiguous loss. It's a loss that remains unclear. It's not knowing what happened to your loved one, whether they're dead or alive. And she says this is traumatizing and long-lasting. It's a form of loss that freezes the grief process and makes closure an impossibility. I think for me, these people have, that have disappeared in the desert, it is a form of violence that is seemingly without end. And I myself thought that after Maricela, that that was the end of the story. 
but in fact it wasn't. It was just the beginning. Christina calls me almost one year to the day that Maricela disappeared. I'm sitting in the Tucson airport getting ready to leave the desert, and she sends me this message on Facebook that says, can you help us? We have a cousin, we have a relative that has gone missing in the desert. And so I went to New York to talk to the family of this person who had gone missing, and I conducted interviews with people who had been with him. This is an interview I conducted with a 13-year-old kid who had been on this trip. And he says to me, we were in the desert for five days, and the water ran out. Jose, his name was Jose, he kept stopping to sit and drink water. There were only a few people left at this point, and a lot of them had stayed behind. Jose was feeling very sick, and at 6 a.m. he fell down and couldn't get up. The smuggler kept yelling at him, get up or I'm going to beat you. And Jose said, I can't do it. I'm too exhausted. I'm sick. Leave me behind and go get help. So they left him with water and went to get help. And they were arrested by immigration two days later. The kid they left behind was a 15-year-old from Cuenca, Ecuador, named Jose Maria Tacuri. And I wanted to understand what, how this had come to be. Why was this kid out there in the desert with a bunch of other kids? What was going on? And so I, 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 I started to, to work with Jose's family um, and did a series of interviews um, in New York. And his dad wanted to really explain to me what had been going on. And he says to me, when I was in, in, Jose, in Cuenca, Jose was my right hand. He was always with me. We were inseparable. But when I came to this country, he became a very rebellious child. We had left him behind, and he had changed. And I said, Jose, what happened? You used to be such a good boy. And he said, no, Poppy, it's your fault. You left me here. We were like brothers. You were my everything. It's your fault that you left me behind. Jose had gotten wild, um, being um, uh, taken care of by a, an elderly grandmother, and had, had turned to, to drinking and partying. He says to him, I didn't leave you because I don't love you. I left you because I wanted to get you to get ahead. But my son didn't understand these things. He was acting up and said he wanted to come to New York. That coming to New York would fill that hole in his heart. Us being reunited would, would help him. And so in 2013, Jose decided to make a trip. They got the coyote, and they went into the desert. And his dad says to me, the last time I spoke to my son, he said to me, Papi, I need to talk to you about something that's very important. And I said, well, tell me right now. And he says, no, no, not right now. I'll tell you when I get there. When I see you in person, I'll tell you. I haven't hugged you in five years, and this is something that I need to tell you in person. His dad says to me, he never told me what he wanted to talk about. But I guess he had met a girl in Ecuador, and they had gone out. And after a while, she had gotten pregnant. That's what he wanted to tell me. Four months after Jose disappeared in the Arizona desert, Maria Jose was born in Ecuador. And Jose's dad says, that is my, that is my, um, my trauma, that I could never tell my son that I will support him and his daughter, that I'll be there for him. And he says to me, there's nothing that I can do right now. I'm helpless. We cannot go look for him. We don't even know where to begin. And every day that passes, we feel more and more out of control. It feels like I'm losing a battle, he says to me. And it's difficult to live like this. And he says to me, to know nothing is so, is so difficult. And I just pray to God that one day I will be reunited with Jose in one form or another. Thank you. Okay, I want to invite any students with questions to please come forward. Okay, we can open. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm 
McKenzie. I'm a sophomore. I'm actually from Michigan, so it's exciting to see some faces. But I was curious um, as to what kind of immigration policy you'd like to see implemented to help, because clearly this isn't working. It's not doing any good for anybody, it really seems like. So what would you like to see in terms of policy going forward? I think we were talking earlier today. It, I never give a very satisfactory answer to this question, because I think is there's so many moving pieces. But if I had to make some some major changes right now, it would be one, to stop this desert, to stop prevention through deterrence, um, to help the people who are already here legalize their status, to take care of our dreamers, um, and then to to figure out something, you know, maybe just a, a, a temporary solution is a is some kind of fair guest worker program that allows for accountability and um, and, and dignity and, and well treatment for people who are here um, d working in our um, in our economy. I think that's a good place to start, and then we can deal with all of the the the, the, the nightmare and the, the meddling in Central America and other places that have created this um, this current problem. Hello, I'm David. I'm uh, first year, and you mentioned earlier on that you, about that people come, came from Mexico from, because of NAFTA, and of course, there's other the reasons like the drug war. What I know it's not your specialty, but what are exactly the factors that would lead someone to go down that dark trip of up through through it, through a desert to get to America? In from what you know, well, NAFTA made it impossible for many um, peasant farmers to make a living growing their own food, growing corn. Um, we flooded that market with US sub subsidized um, uh, products that out basically competed these farmers who then had to leave and find, and find work elsewhere. Um, for many, many decades, th that was the number one thing pushing people out of Mexico was, was economics. But now, I mean, this issue is so much more complicated and all the folks who are coming from Central America they're coming because they're poor. Uh, they're coming because of, um, of, of of economic issues, but they're also coming now because of the rampant violence. I mean, you literally, um, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, is a place where you can be sh you can be killed on a daily basis for just being on a street corner. And so the kids who are coming here now are basically literally running for their lives. I mean, they're poor people who are not just running because they're poor, but they're running because um, if they stay home, they're gonna they're gonna die. Um, and so things have gotten a lot more complicated in terms of the factors pushing people out of these countries now and the factors pu and, and pulling them here. Right? They know here that we hate them at the desert, we hate them at the border, and we love them once they enter the, the labor market because um, we don't seem to have a problem with them doing all this work, um, you know, including the, the President of the United States who has been on record hiring undocumented people to work in things like the, like the Trump Hotel. Um, so we're, we're, sending this, we're sending this message this, that, that is really contradictory. Uh, but, but folks are coming for all, a whole bunch of reasons now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheska and I'm a sophomore. And my question is actually a follow-up to that. So that being said that we have the concept that these, uh, that these migrants coming from the U.S. southern border, right, from the Sonoran Desert, are criminals and, um, or are bringing criminal activity up to the, uh, the U.S. How do we change the narrative in which that these indi individuals, human beings, are, you know, are more than just that and not criminals as well? That's hard. I don't know. Um, changing the narrative, I, I think we are flooded right now in the, in the media with stories about immigration to the point that there's so much out there and it seems to be repeating itself that I think we just, we ignore it. I cannot keep up with the, with the news cycle um, and, and I, for one, am sick of the same stories that we keep being told. It's either migrants or, or, or criminals or, or, um, or migrants or, or, or heroic people. And obviously, there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening there that needs to be addressed. Um, but we are in this current moment where the xenophobia and the racism and the way in which we talk about immigrants is so deeply disturbing, yet also a fundamentally American thing. We have been demonizing immigrants in this country since its founding. You know, Ellis Island was not a wonderful place to show up with people welcome you with open arms and, and pizza. Ellis Island was a place where you were there to be um, to be ripped off, abused, um, treated like uh, um, like like subhuman people, and we forget that. We forget we used to hate the Irish till they became white. We used to hate the Chinese. We used to hate the Japanese. Um, and this current moment now, we're just repeating ourselves. And and I don't know if linking up those histories to show that we keep doing this over and over again, and we know that it's not a good thing to be doing, is that a way to change the narrative? Maybe. Um, maybe find some way to help people understand that. 
that it's not an immigration story, it's a human story. And so can we see ourselves in these people? Can we see ourselves in, um, in an immigrant story? Maybe that's a way to create empathy. Um, but I'm open, I'm all ears. Um, any way that we can do it to get people to think about um, this issue beyond legal, illegal. Um, we need to think about it as a, as a global human crisis that we all have some accountability for. Hi, I'm Adriana, I'm a junior. I was wondering how do you uh, make sure that your research, whether it's through photography or your anthropology notes, how do you make sure that it becomes more than just shock value for the people who are listening and can't really understand what these migrants are going through? You know, I, I always want to be able to tell stories and so that you walk away not going, there was a, it was a, it was super graphic and, and I remember the, I remember the kind of graphicness of it, but you know, can you walk away and remember that a person with a name and a family I experienced this horrible violence? Um, that's something that we've, we've been trying in all kinds of different ways. I mean, for me, a key to it is to write accessibly. So rather than um, trying to um, overly complicate the narrative um, through you know, the academic training that I have, um, I really want to be simple. I mean, I'm a pretty simple person. Um, and so I want to maintain the, that, that narrative so that it's, it is accessible and, un and understandable. Uh, I think that's a, a, a really key part of the whole thing is to not either make it too shocking or to not um, overthink it and over theorize it to the point that you have sucked the life out of these stories that I think are so moving and important. Hi, I'm Owen, and I'm a sophomore, and I was wondering, um, I've seen lots of stories on the news lately about how um, Border Patrol agents have been known to destroy sources of water and food for migrants that are crossing the desert and things like that. And also, wouldn't it be technically trespassing if that would be private land if the Border Patrol agents were to do that? Um, so there has been lots of evidence of the Border Patrol slashing water bottles that have been left for migrants in the desert, um, throwing away food. Um, th there's lots of videos that you can go on YouTube and, and you can watch. Um, the agency has been trying to, to prevent that, and um, I have a, a, a complicated relationship with Border Patrol, um, but it's, it's, it's nuanced enough that I would never, I would never demonize all agents or um, the overall organization. I think it's a much more complicated story, but there are, there are bad, um, bad seeds there. Um, in terms of trespassing, if you've been spending time in southern Arizona, you know that your civil liberties fly out the window. So trespassing is like the least of people's worries. I mean, I've, I've had guns put in my face. I've had I our house um, uh, attempted illegal searches of vehicles, of houses. Um, so it's, it's within 80 miles of, 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 of an international boundary, there's a lot of gray area about what's, uh, what these agents can and can't do. All right, we're going to run out of time, so let's thank uh, Professor DeLeon for an uh, interesting conversation. Thank you.